measures absolutely pure. Uh, is that a a reli- religious you know connotation there, or, or is it you know just because of the the I guess the value system is that correct? Considering that these things are what operates, you know, um, the 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 merchant uh, society, so to speak. Well, it's more than just the merchant society. It was if you lost uh, grasp on your measurements to do with length mm. or your volumes or even your grain weights, then you lost grasp on your science. Hmm. You know, no longer understood the number of days it took for the moon to fulfill its 18.613 year lunar mutation cycle, which was very, very important to your civilization. You no longer remembered the equatorial size of the Earth and how to grid reference it for successful navigation. Hmm. You no longer remembered things like the 345 triangle or the special navigational triangle that was built into both the um, Great Pyramid of Cheops and also in, uh, into the Menkare Pyramid. Mm. Uh, re- maintaining these sciences, maintaining your increments of length perfectly was absolutely essential to being able to navigate, uh, go from place to place, um, mm. to have uh, very accurate calendar systems so that you could plant and harvest on time. Hmm. And, um, you know, the ability to map your country and do trigonometric calculations yeah. so that everything was worked out very, very well. Hmm. Um, these are all a part of the concept of civilization, and without them, you cannot have civilization or a national identity hmm. for your nation. Yeah, yeah. And and a, a little bit later, I, I really like to, you know, get into talking more about your book and, and especially about... Uh, New Zealand, and and then we'll continue in talking more about uh, Sweden, the connection with the Vikings. But I, g- I got to ask you one more thing on on all of this that we've been talking about, uh, which obviously is, of course, what what happened to this civilization, to these people. I mean, was it you know kind of a, a global cataclysm, or or was this a political thing that 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 happened? Do you, do you have any ideas about this? Yes, I can see that wherever our people set up civilizations, um, there were always the camp followers, the ones that lived on the periphery, the ones that um, were there to grab the trappings of civilization, the um, the abundance, if you like, uh, the technologies. Mm, yeah. And slowly, slowly, these other groups or nations would um, infiltrate uh, into the societies, and then at a certain point, <clears throat> they would overwhelm and our people would have to flee. And it Hmm. happened time and time and time again that our civilizations had to be abandoned and our people had to move on to other locations. And um, many of the great edifices um, that are scattered around the world, which are now attributed to other peoples, were in Hmm. fact built by the European uh, family of nations. Hmm. And I can absolutely detect that always in their measurements. The way... I um, follow the movement or migrations of our people is by the measurements that they left in the landscape. Fascinating, and yeah, I, w- I got to return to to this this part a little bit later because I have so many questions that pop up in my head here. But l- let's go a little bit more into you know uh, talking about your book and 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 especially the connection then to to New Zealand and and what. Uh, I mean, first of all, um, th- this, of course, is because, you know, this is your place of origin and, and you started there. But um, how, how did you first, you know, pick up on this uh, trait in, in, in New Zealand? And, uh, and, and how did you, you know, spawn all of this material into, into your book? Well, like I said earlier, um, I knew of the existence of these people uh, because of what was written in our earliest history books, and mm. also what was openly acknowledged by the, the learned elders of the, the Maori people, yeah. the Matwas and Tohungas and the Kuyas and, uh, yeah, just the, the learned elders. Um, but across the landscape of New Zealand, there have been, you know, many sort of anomalous structures um, seen, and I decided that I would investigate these, go out on the landscape and actually start 
looking for them and looking at them. And, and once um, you get an eye for it, you can immediately detect them. Um, most New Zealanders, because they don't expect to see these things in the landscape, will see a pile of rocks over in a field and just say, well, it's just a natural occurrence. They'll mm. never even think twice about it. Mm. But I walk up to these piles and assess them and find that there is an order to them and then look around and um, see that uh, way off in the distance on the horizon is a very prominent mountain. And uh, through calculations or observations, are able to see that from the hubstone of the observatory, um, the sun will rise right on that pinnacle or point mm. of the day of the equinox or yeah. one of the solstices, this type of thing. Um, it's been a, a long sort of slow process of um, comparative analysis, building up a dossier of information, mm. finding more sites all the time. Um, it's something that's happened over a period of many years. Mm. You start off knowing very little or nothing, and then before you know it, you've... Uh, You've learned a huge amount. Yeah, certainly. And do you, have you have you travelled uh, much to to many of the, the the other places around the world, or have you you know studied studied them uh, through books and so forth? Um, yeah, well, I, I've um, you know spent a lot of time in the United States. Uh, actually, my father was an American serviceman mm. who uh, came to New Zealand during the Second World War and married my mother, who was from New Zealand. And um, I was actually born in Los Angeles, um, oh. but then raised up, up in New Zealand. But mm. later I went back to the United States and spent many years there. Then during the height of the Vietnam War, I decided I mm, didn't really care much for that war. So mm. just before I was conscripted into the uh, army to head for Vietnam, I decided to go and pull my heels in Europe. So I, mm. I lived over there, mainly in France and Germany, for three years. Mm. And... Um, returned to the States, then returned to New Zealand. But at the time, I wasn't really terribly interested in um, visiting the sites. Um, I should really have gone out to Brittany and uh, had a look at the uh, all of the standing megaliths there. But yeah. uh, <laughs> I was interested in other things at the time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, I mean, tell us about... Yeah, I, I know that you, you sent me one link uh, With uh, you know some fascinating structures on on, um, on Bombay at the Bombay Hills. I mean, tell us more about that. Right. Well, um, uh, we have uh, in the Auckland region. Uh, it's quite fascinating, really. Um, well, they say they call it 36 volcanic cones. So these hmm. are uh, hills right throughout the city where I live which are, um, you know, upthrusts or uh, they were once volcanoes a long, long time ago. Yeah. And these are all very beautifully carved, like they have terraces all over them. Uh, a huge amount of labor has gone into um, actually uh, fashioning the hills and uh, bringing in assembly plateaus. Uh, somebody here a long, long time ago uh, did massive, massive earthworks hmm. just here in Auckland. But um, I started to find a um, the beginnings of a an alignment running through a particular Auckland hill, and um, also out in the south of the city, uh, when a big uh, highway was being put through in 1992, the um, excavating bulldozers um, just cut the ground, and right there were many beautiful obelisks, uh, some with incising on them, hmm. and uh, these had been tumbled uh, during the 186 AD um, explosion of um, a big volcano at Taupo. It was hmm. the biggest explosion in the last 5,000 years, oh. um, the effects of which were um, seen in Rome, hmm. um, and uh, the sound of which was heard in China. <laughs> and uh, it sent a ripple through the ground in New Zealand, tumbled these obelisks. <laughs> and I could tell they were a part of an alignment system, so I started to trace the alignment. Mm. Um, this alignment, um, I presently traced it from a town a bit north of me called Silverdale, mm. where they put markers there. Then it goes to a tall mound um, on the top of the Okura Ridge. Then it goes to... Um, what we call Mount Wellington, one of the central volcanic cones of Auckland City where there's a, a special uh, marker mound built there. Then it goes to Totara Park uh, out in a suburb called Munyarewa. 
uh, where there's a, uh, a beautiful tall mound built there. Then it carries on to what we call the Mount William Walkway, which is far to the south of the city where the, the uh, marker mounds are still there. Mm. And it carries on from there all the way down the country to another hill much further south uh, called Puke More Hill and then carries on way down the country uh, still all the way to Taupo. Hmm. And we haven't traced all of it yet, but it's, um, it's for land mapping, really. It's like hmm. a, um, a central line that dissects the North Island perfectly in the centre, hmm. and people in outline areas could refer back to points of the line to do their uh, trigonometry, their... Um, you know, their land mapping. Yeah, yeah. Do, do you think that these lines connect with uh, uh, ley lines and so forth? Right, I hear a lot about ley lines, and people talk about, you know, um, lines of energy that run here and there, and, and yeah. um, you know, uh, some very uh, depth douses and that pick up on these sorts of ley lines. Yeah. I myself don't actually deal with anything that's based on energies as such. I don't have that kind of talent. Mm. But um, I just look for physical things which are very tangible and, um, you know, that uh, you can um, subject to the five senses, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're there, they're very physical and tangible and they are structures in absolute straight lines across the countryside, mm. very much like the, uh, the Michael and Mary lines of uh, southern England. They are definitely physical lines, although people have doused energies from place to place to place. You know? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Ah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and um, I mean, time is moving so fast here, and, uh, and we got a you know a, a part two coming up here. We're going to talk more in the subscriber section sh- soon. But I, I, I want to you know dive into a, a little bit about you know the 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 Vikings and and and, and this sort of stuff bef- before we go into part two here. And um, I know that you you know you you have an, an article on your site there. Uh, uh, that is entitled, entitled Viking Navigational Techniques, and uh, it's the subtitle is How Ancient Scandinavians Were Able to Sail to New Zealand. So, I mean, there have been, according to you, uh, at least a, a connection here also between, you know, uh, the, the, the Vikings and the people, uh, the ancient people of New Zealand, correct? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I believe the Vikings were just one of many, many sort of groups that got here. They would be um, a fairly late era group, but we uh, have uh, down at um, a place called Raglan, which is south of where I live, um, a friend of mine, uh, Terry Stoddart, um, he's found a lot of stones there that are incised, and one of the stones has runes on it, you know, or rune-type markings. Yeah, yeah. Um, but not only that, there are quite a few sort of legends to do with uh, sort of Viking influences in, in that area. And uh, they're actually quite um, uh, optimistic of finding a fairly large ship there. Um, it has been uncovered, but under the present uh, political situation, it gets recovered very, very quickly. If something doesn't suit the... Um, the social historians and social archaeologists, if you like, yeah. the very PC regime, <laughs> and it's immediately hidden, and that's the big problem we have in this country. Why, why, why do you but, think? Um, why do you think that is? Why, why is it being hid- hidden? I think it's the same thing that uh, Thor Heyerdahl, with his amazing work, yeah, um, encountered. Yeah. You know, you're up against um, a very established group of isolationists who believe that <laughs> there was no diffusionism that. Um, uh, there was a little bit of land hopping over a long, long period of time. And to show that um, Vikings or people from the Northern Hemisphere could go to the very ends of the earth mm. uh, really flies in the face of the whole isolationist sort of theory. Yeah. And um, it would absolutely upset all of their um, all of their writings, all of their books, uh, all of <laughs> their concepts. Um, yeah. Sciences like historical linguistics, uh, for example, would have to be rewritten. Hmm. Um, yeah. So, um, I mean, okay, I, I'm, I guess I'm a more, you know, to the conspiracy side of this, but, I mean, considering what, what, what you said earlier about, you know, that this was about, you know, measurement and key, 